Thank you so much, Jeremy, for being here. I am excited, super excited to dive deep in what you do. I know you're very hands-on with a lot of um, entrepreneurs and got a lot of good stuff going on there. But I'm first curious, what is something that most people don't know about you? Ah, well, outside of my uh, business life, I'm a songwriter. And it's mostly just for fun, but I've been doing it for years and years, decades and decades. And my kind of claim to fame there is that I once wrote a song that ended up in a Disney movie. How did that happen? Well, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll make the long story short. Um, I had a, a bit of an advantage in that a friend of mine was the director of the movie. And he uh, and so he said, you know, look, we're we're gathering songs for this movie if you want to submit one i'll put it in the pool can't guarantee anything but you know at least you'll be in the mix i said okay and he sent me the script all these things wrote a song didn't spend much time on it and it months and months passed didn't hear anything and then one day i get an email from my friend he's like it's in and i was like well that's awesome so that that's that's kind of how it happened and Got paid a little bit of money for it, not a whole lot. And uh, the movie was called Prom. And uh, this was in, I think, 2011, it came out. And it was kind of a one-off. I've never done anyth anything like that again. But it was pretty cool, pretty cool experience. And most of what you do now is like hobby? Is any of it at all business? For You mean songwriting? Yeah. No, it's not business. I mean, I don't try to make any money at it. It's I take it kind of seriously. I mean, I, I do it regularly and like really you know, pay attention to it and kind of do it in a serious way, but it's really just because I like it. Cool. Okay. Let's get a little bit into what you do um, as a co-founder of Conversa. Um, I know you've done quite a couple of businesses and I'm curious, like what made you decide to do this together with another person? Yeah. So, well, I'll give a little context, a little background, if that's okay. So, Conversa, as you mentioned, uh, that's a company that I started about four and a half years ago, focused on B2B podcasting. And I founded it on my own. And then after a couple of years, like built a small team to help with fulfillment and producing the podcasts. And I still have that team in place. And that business is still up and running. More recently, I partnered um, with a guy named Jan, Jan Ilunga, who I met online through networking. And we partnered up to start something that we call Expert Content Pros. And that's a, a video service where we, uh, we help uh, people like coaches, authors, small business people create short form video. And we have this whole process that makes it really, really easy, sort of lower cost, super easy to do, fun to do. And then we produce short form video that people can use on their websites or on social media uh, and we, we also have a service for getting video testimonials. So so that's a little bit of background. And I think your question was about sort of how I like how, how why I partnered up with somebody to do it. Was that the question? Yeah. Like what made you decide that, you know, what this I want to do with the partner versus yeah. like just do it on my own? Well, you know, actually, for years, I had kind of wished that I had a, a business partner because it's hard, you know, just running a business is hard. And, uh, and especially, I mean, I'm doing all this stuff more or less for the first time, don't have a lot of experience with it. And when it's just you, I mean, it can be, especially when everything's remote, it can be a little bit lonely. Sometimes it can be a little isolating and you really, you cannot start or run a business on your own. Not, not really. I mean, you need a community. You need at least a network of people that you can ask for help, you know, because there's a lot of unknowns and every decision you make is really important, but often you're, you're not sure if it's the right decision necessarily. So as I mentioned, I had kind of wished that I'd had a partner, but I feel like it's not something you can just make happen. You know, you have to have the right people, the right person. And, and, you often I it seems to me often it's like people who've been friends and they're like, hey, let's start a business, you know, and that just didn't exactly happen with me. So several months ago when I met Jan online, um, we just kind of clicked and hit it off and kind of kept talking. 
and it became and then sort of started doing some projects together like on a kind of a smaller scale um and it became kind of clear after i don't know three or four months that we were just a good fit and we kind of both at the same time were like made or i think we're partners on this and 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 i actually i really got to give Jan most of the credit actually cuz he's the one who really um kind of organized things and scheduled calls and kind of kept things going and and i was happy to do it cuz i cuz i'm like this guy knows what he's talking about and we get along and and we enjoy doing things together um but he really kind of made it happen and then i it kind of dawned on me at some point i'm like i think i found a partner here you know it's not so easy it's like just we're thinking about things in the same way we're kind of at a similar stage in what we're doing and Jan is also kind of like me he's uh has his own businesses you know been doing this for a while pretty much him you know partnering with other people here and there um and we just kind of clicked and i think a lot of things have to be in the right place for it to work and it just kind of worked, but I can say it's been awesome because there's just so many benefits to working with somebody else, having a, a real partner, not just someone who's doing some work for you, but a real partner who's has skin in the game and is invested. You can just get so much more done, you know? Um, it's, it's more fun. It's more enjoyable. It's less stressful because you have someone to talk to and bounce ideas off of. It's just, it's been really, really beneficial in pretty much every way so far. Cool. Yeah. Jan, um, people who listen to this regularly will recognize Jan. He did, he's the one that did the LinkedIn audit, did a whole LinkedIn audit for you guys. Um, mm -hmm. Well, he did it of my profile, but for you to literally step by step. Um, and I could, I've also spoken to him quite a few times um, and I could see how your um, personalities go really well um, together. He is a very genuine person and yeah. makes those calls, takes the action. Um, that's cool. I'm curious um, a little bit. You work with business owners and entrepreneurs. Yeah. I'm curious what it's like for you providing for business owners. Um, if they, let's say, either have ADHD or just have like some sort of challenge um, it could be something going on in their lives. It could be like, you know, that they're just like really not good at doing certain things. They don't execute on certain things, things like that. Like, how do you communicate with them? How do you really make sure to support them? So that way, um, mm -hmm. get the results that you're looking for. Yeah. You know, I think in some ways it's not that different than, than it is to communicate with anybody, you know, any business owner, whether they have ADHD or not. Right. I think the same principles apply. And perhaps in a given case with somebody with ADHD, you need to there's some variation on it or maybe you need to do some parts of it more or something like that. But I think the basic principles are always the same, namely um, they're being very clear in your communications, um, timely and prompt with communications, you know, doing what you say you're going to do not assuming knowledge on the part of the person that you're communicating with and providing them with, you know, all the resources that they need. Um, you know, I guess for like ADHD can manifest differently in, in a given person, right? It's not the same experience for everybody, but generally speaking, right. It can just, it can mean having some difficulty with keeping track of details, right. Or just getting distracted, right. Having a dif difficulty concentrating, and so I think in those instances, um, you know, you would just want to take more care and certainly allow for that, you know, and maybe be a little, if someone doesn't respond to you right away, let's say, or you need to send something again, you know, because they didn't get it, um, just be okay with that. But, which is not that difficult, I feel, because I, everything seems a little chaotic to me these days. You know, as far as I know, I don't have ADHD. I've never been diagnosed with it. But, you know, I struggle with keeping track of stuff sometimes or, you know, losing things. I mean, and again, that's one one thing that, that Jan is a lot better at than me. It's just like very organized, you know, which is super helpful because I'm not naturally that way. And so, um, I don't know, that's a bit of a roundabout answer, but 
I'll stop talking for now. <laughs> Let yeah. you ask a follow up question. It's it's a good one because I think it's very much about like understanding other people. So being clear. Oh, yeah. Um, like you're not assuming and then like being understanding and for some people that's being understanding about the fact that they have ADHD and for some people it's being understanding they have like a crisis at home um, and sometimes being understanding knowing you have no idea what's going on in the other person's life or business um, sure. and so when you just like approach it with grace then um, we can support our clients in, in a not much better way I think that's a good way of, of putting it approaching it with grace and and really, you know, especially in a remote situation, which my business, my, the work I do with Jan, you know, it's completely remote. It's very rare that I ever meet someone in person and for better and for worse, you know, and, and I think especially because it's remote, you just have to, you really don't know what's going on in, in people's lives outside of the, of the, you know, time you spent with them on the screen right? Which is usually like very focused on a particular thing. And so, yeah, I, I, it seems to me that most of the people that I interact with have approach it this way, like are pretty, you know, approach it with a, at least enough grace that if you have to like reschedule a meeting or something happened or even missing a meeting like that, you know, I do that sometimes meeting on my calendar I'm, and I somehow just miss it and feel horrible. And people are almost always pretty cool about it. You know, it's interesting to see, like, I sometimes think about it, like what you could actually pick up online versus what actually happened, because like they could be all polite in the email, but you have no idea what actually went on at home. And they're like, oh, yeah. uh, like, <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> they got some time to cool down before they sent that email about the fact that you missed it. Um, So yeah. it just makes me. No, I obviously like in person better. Like there's nothing like in person. Um, obviously there's pros to the to the um virtual right. We could do any from anywhere and meet anyone right. and all those sort of things. Um, but like real relationships do happen in person. And it's interesting. It's like maybe I don't know, it just you just got me thinking. That's it. My brain's going a little bit on a wild <laughs> wild research. Well, it, it it is interesting, I think. I mean, yeah, there's no there's no replacing being in person with other people. Like I think you just said before, I mean, that's how you really form relationships. I think that's right. And there are levels, right? I mean, you can certainly, like doing something through a screen, you can get to know someone to a certain degree, right? It's a lot better than just emailing, let's say. Yeah. But there's just, but it's it's still at a far remove from being in the same room with a person and really spending time and getting to know them, right? It's a very different experience. Um, and, you know, COVID really was kind of in, in a lot of different ways was sort of a global experiment in a lot of different things, right? Like, what would it be like if kids in school stopped going to school and just learned remotely? And we all kind of learned like, yeah, that that's horrible. <laughs> that doesn't work, right? But that, that was interesting to me because it seemed like long before COVID, there was just a lot of speculation about like, remember MOOCs? I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but I, I don't even remember what it, what it stood for, but it was like something online. It was basically distance learning. And it's kind of this idea that like, yeah, you could just do classes online, right? Or like tape a lecture and then watch it. And there, there's some value to that, but I think we kind of learned at least for younger children, but I would say really for anybody, yeah, le there's something about learning where you need to be in the same place with other people. And if you never have that, you're really miss. It's not as good of an experience. You don't learn as well, right? Outside the, the realm of learning, I forming relationships, really getting to know people. It has to be in person, at least sometimes, at least a little bit. And there's only so much you can do through the screen. But on the other hand, thank God we have this technology because my business couldn't exist without it. That's for sure. Yeah. It's, uh, well, your business not only won't exist without it, your whole business is um, based on the fact that like, the like gate only came about because of the fact that there's internet. Oh yeah, for sure. Like so many businesses. Yeah. You know? hundred percent hundred percent yeah it, 
feel like going a whole thing of like what what sort of businesses come from what sort of industries uh, for, of like what sort of inventions but I I'm going to take it a slightly a slightly sure. different perspective of what is the what do you find the biggest challenge right now in running and growing your businesses hmm it would probably be an easier question to ask what is not a big challenge and there's everything's challenging right um I, mean, I just want to think about this for a second i mean i think the single biggest challenge for any business or I'll, I'll limit it a little bit to a business like mine which is a service a service business um is you know just selling right keeping your sales pipeline full your prospect pipeline full and closing deals um that that's just difficult and i think it's always difficult there's it's not like it's difficult these days or whatever it's just takes a lot of work and dedication and it's something that's not necessarily super complicated but just difficult you know and it's like business 101 i mean it's not like a complex idea or anything i think everyone knows this but it's difficult to the to the point that there's there's an entire industry helping people do it you know books and coaches, there's people helping people helping people doing it right <laughs> Right. Like an, a whole industry just focused on, we will help you, you know, do lead generation, keep your pipeline full. Jan does that. He's an expert in that. And I, you know, that's, if, if it was, if it was easy to do, then you wouldn't need people to help you, you know, but it's just hard. Like, I think one fundamental lesson that you learn, I'll, I'll say that I learned, you know, starting a business and not having a business background is just very fundamentally convincing someone you don't know to exchange money for whatever it is that you're offering, you know, a good or a service is really hard. Yeah. People are careful about, you know, at least in the, in the B2B world, right? Like pretty damn careful about what they spend their money on. And there's a lot of competition. And so, you know, every time you make a sale, it's like kind of a big deal. And it's, you know what I mean? Like, I've definitely felt that in my, like, come to appreciate sort of the, just how hard that is. And because at the end of the day, like, every single thing you do, all of your efforts that I spend time on every day is just toward that end. Just yeah. trying to get another person or business or entity to trust me enough, trust us enough to sign the contract and be like, all right, let's do this. There's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. You know, it's like one thing buying like a quick, I don't know, takeout. It's like, okay, worst case, like you don't like it, right? 10 bucks and like for your meal. It's another thing when it's like you're investing in your business and we're talking about thousands um, yeah. of dollars. And we're also hoping to get results um, and things like that. Um, I had a question for you, but I forgot what it was. So when it comes back to me, but meanwhile. Okay, yeah. Um, where can people find you, connect with you, and learn more about you? Yeah, sure. So um, a couple options. LinkedIn is always a good one. You can search for Jeremy Shear. I think there's there are a lot of other Jeremys on there, maybe one or two other Shears, but I think I'm the only Jeremy Shear. So you can find me there. Um, my, You're uh, S-H-E-R-E. <laughs> S-H-E-R-E, that's right. Links um, will be below, but yeah. You can, if you're interested in, you know, what I do, then a couple different websites, uh, conversa.com is one. It's conversa with two N's. Um, expertcontentpros.com is another one. Um, so those two websites, you can kind of learn the, the what is it, you know, that I do. Um, if anyone wants to hear that song that I mentioned, uh, the song is called In Deep, like being deep in love, that kind of thing. So if you were to Google um, prom, the name of the movie, and then in deep, you'll on YouTube, it'll pop up. You can listen to that. Um, Check that out. I don't know. That's probably enough options, right? Yeah, still will be in the show notes. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Final question. What is something controversial that you believe in? Ooh, something controversial that I believe in. So this would be in the ballpark of like, flat earthers kind of stuff 
in take it how you want it question. <laughs> Ooh, man. Hmm. Well, there's, there's some stuff that's coming to mind that I'm not going to say because, because of genuine. I'm really curious. <laughs> well, I'll tell uh, maybe I'll tell you once we're not recording, but there's some stuff that like these days you have to be careful. You have to be careful. What that's you why I asked the question can... because I don't, I want to be careful. <laughs> well, I, but I do, I don't want to be canceled or anything, you know, I'm okay. But let me, let me come up with a good, something controversial that I believe in. Hmm. How long can we sit here in silence? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Can, can you get, can you, can you like prompt me a little bit to, to get me thinking? I'm not sure. Yeah. It could be either like general things, right? Like you said, like flat earth type things. It could be even just like your approach to something about business or how you see people, or you think that there's a certain skill that schools should be focusing on. It could be. Ah, and it oh, could okay. be anything. Okay, well, here's here's something. It's not it's not super original to me, but I do kind of believe it. I think that on some level, I think SEO is kind of garbage. What makes you say that? Because I think just focusing on just getting as many people as possible to your website is kind of a fool's errand because you don't want just anyone to come to your website. Like you want the right kind of people, right? It doesn't matter if you get 10,000 visitors a month, if only like 1% of them, you know, are in your market. Right. Yeah. I'm not an SEO expert. So, you know, I am fully open to being, having my mind changed on this, you know, I'm not an expert. So, but this is just kind of my sense of it. And I don't think I'm alone. And I think that especially with AI, the more that people are turning to AI rather than say kind of more traditional Google search, that the perceived value of SEO, or maybe not even the perceived, just the actual value of SEO as we traditionally think about it will decline. Um, and, and I guess I say this partly because I used to think like when I started out, one of the first things I did when I was like building my business, I'm like, well, I need a website. And I spent a lot of time, you know, putting, and I did it myself at first, right? Oh, wow. Building this website and creating all kinds of things for it. And, you know, it can be endless. And I spent a ton of time on it and I've come to learn. And, you know, again, this is very basic stuff for anyone who's more experienced, but like you, you don't need a fancy website right at, at least right away maybe not ever depending on what you're doing you know you just need some, like the minimum viable product kind of website and then you really focus on getting an, on a pipeline you know yeah, that's really what that. matters but for people like me who don't who didn't know any better you know it just and even like so with expert content pros right like when i kind of started this and and a little bit before i met jan and then i met him like I didn't, I was starting to do it and get business long before there was anything online about, it. you know, so there's no SEO involved at all because there was nothing to SEO, you know, like you couldn't find it online. And I was like, well, are people even going to be searching for this? Because it doesn't, I'm, I'm kind of creating a new idea here, you know, so SEO didn't really seem to be very valuable and it, and it wasn't, and it isn't as far as I'm concerned. It's a little bit case by case, right? For no, some, a good, in a some good. cases, I'm sure in some cases, I'm obviously wrong and it matters quite a bit, but at least in my own personal experience, it really hasn't, it's never been at the top of my list of like, oh, I need to focus on and spend a lot of money on SEO. It's just not that valuable to me. Yeah, I think you made a very, very, very good point about the fact of like the fancy website versus getting clients. And I think that is was definitely a big like myth or I don't know, people have to understand this when they get into business. It's like, you're not in business when you have a website, you're in business when people pay you money. 
for you to provide right. a service or a product or something. And I guess that's why most people who think they have businesses like go under um really quickly. Like I don't know the percentages off my head, but <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> well, it's it's sort of like a website's kind of a low hanging fruit kind of thing, right? It's something that you can just do and you can feel good about it. Like, look at my cool website or, you know, if it's it being built, you can see in real time it's coming together. And right, you can kind of, it can give you the false sense of like, well, I'm in business now. I have a website and, you know, let the let the cash roll in. Right. And right. then, you know, you it's a naive way to think about it. And that's how I thought about it for sure. Not knowing any better. And then you learn, you know, through experience, like, oh, no one gives a crap about your website. Not really. They just, it's just a tool and they just may want to, they want some very specific kinds of information, usually if they ever go to your website and that's it. And you really need to be spending your time on the things that are much less fun, much less glamorous, but way more important, like networking and building that pipeline or just getting product market fit, figuring out who, who the hell am I even trying to sell this to? That's another big one, right? Like you start out with some idea or like the classic big mistake there is like, well, I sell to everybody, you know, everyone was going to love my thing. Why wouldn't they, you know, which is going to get you nowhere, of course, but it's, it takes a lot of time and effort and trial and error to really hone in on exactly who your, your, your audience is. And it never stops. Even when you think you've got it, you learn another wrinkle and there's always more to learn and, you know, be careful about getting too wedded to whatever your initial concept is or was for the good or service you're selling. Because often when you first create it, you have, you don't really know what it's, what it's going to be or what it needs to be because you don't yet know enough about your customers. And, but the more you learn, you have to be willing to shift and pivot and, you know, all these things that in hindsight, you're like, well, of course that's how it works. But at least for me, I had to learn that the hard way. Not just you. I think it's um, every entrepreneur that I've spoken to. Obviously, some people, it's one struggle over the other, but there's like way too much. We just get caught up in the wrong things. And I guess that's why we learned from yep. people who've done it previously, right? Exactly. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Jeremy. This was fun. I appreciate yeah. um, your insights, your experience. Um, and I know that the audience has gotten confirmed too. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it.